excess and less get all together. On the top of it, I claim, populism has always an element of, as they put it in France, je ne veux rien savoir. I don't want to know anything about it. There is always an element of this willful, like, don't bullshit me with complexity, complexity, tell me simply who the elements are, and so on and so on. And let me tell you a transcendental experience of mine, metaphysical, in the sense of, uh, like, a simple thing. Maybe you know the story, it's wonderful. I, when this crisis, no, later even, uh, I think, maybe, did I already mention this, where I was sitting, sorry, now I'm really afraid that I'm repeating myself, even with regard to what I'm doing here. Did I already told you the story of how, when there was that, when there were those tea parties in the United States, tea parties, you know, uh, Republicans protesting Obama, Texas, how I was sitting behind a TV, did I? No, no. okay, okay. No, it's a wonderful story. I will tell you what shocked me. And this brings us back to the principal articulation. I was jumping between the two TV programs, tired as a dog in a hotel. The one, of course, sorry to tell you, uh, let's make a test if some of you are from the United States. Which TV ch channel do you watch for news? Um. Fox. <laughs> Funny, they are the only amusing ones. I hate those bloodless liberals. It's passion there, they are I know they are disgusting. I'm not crazy, but okay. As usual, I was watching Fox News, no? But then on PBS, I noticed a, a nice documentary on, you know who is Pete Seeger, that great leftist mm -hmm. yeah. folk icon. Okay. Uh, and then something so On Fox News, there was a live transmission of one of these. Republican meetings uh, against Obama. No, all this, you know, Obama, big bad, taxi state, and so on. And there was a kind of a fake folk singer singing an anti-Obama song. And then I was jumping between this and Pete Ziger song. <laughs> what e extraordinarily shocked me is the resemblance. There was a Pete Seeger song saying, we ordinary people screwed by the big business and blah, blah, blah. And I love Pete Seeger. Then I jumped, this guy says, Washington bureaucracy taking out taxes, we poor working people of Texas will pay the price and so on and so on. How, this is, this is what I'm aiming at. How, and this is a very sad tendency in the United States, how this fundamental populist anti-central power motive is almost totally today uh, reappropriated and changed into the rightist into the rightist change. So again, I totally agree uh, agree with you here. I I I I I think I don't first the second thing that I think is if you read his book, but it's an interesting book, although it has a violent attack on me, uh, his book The Populist Reason, it has very nice moments, but I think simply that his purely formal notion of populism is too abstract in what sense. She is forced to proclaim communi for populists, people like Mao Zedong, Yugoslav President Tito and so on, which I think is madness. In no reasonable sense of politics are they, are they populists. I think that, again, populism is precisely a way to appeal to all this reference, ordinary hardworking people, blah, blah, but denying the fundamental antagonism. And again, the problem of Ernesto is that uh, he thinks that this is uh, essentialism and so on and so on. My problem with him is another one, that if you look at his own work, he denies it, but uh, don't he get something more ambiguous? I think that it's not even true that in his own work, all different struggles are really just floating in the same way. His, and especially with Chantal Mouffe, who is also, has some interesting reflections here, they obviously privilege the so-called democratic revolution. And for them, if you look it closely, or he, he, they even put it directly like this in that hegemony, a socialist strategy book, that all other struggles are basically for them the extension of democratic struggle. As they put it, feminist struggle emerged when 
people said, okay, if equality, why not also democracy for women? Then socialism, when people said, if political equality, why not also economic justice and so on and so on. So again, uh, again, I agree with you if your point is that. Uh, and, uh, sorry, and then I have another uh, Another problem which is even more fundamental here with Ernesto is that, uh, you know, I developed this in that triple orgy book where it was a very paradoxical experience, that hegemony, uh, or no, contingency, whatever, the book of debates between me, Judith Butler and Ernesto. The paradox was that uh, at the end, I stopped being friendly, he started, he, he turned against me personally, Ernesto. With Judith it went okay. But already while we were writing it, Ernesto got violent, first it was a conflict with Judith. Because he was so brutal and patronizing in some, in replying to her, you know, this type of style, and she was fully justified in being furious. She asked him to tone it down. For example, I know she started a paragraph with, oh, our beloved Judy is here, shooting with her standard guns and so on, you know, this kind of a patronizing attitude. But, so then he moved to me and things turned violent, 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 precisely concerning this uh, class struggle and so on. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the problem of historicity is not solved there, in the sense of, I make this point, but I think, and I think it's also a weak point of Judith, and typically I never got an answer from them. My problem is, and this brings us back to Hegel, to historicity, why historicism is not true historicity. Uh, do you know, I hope you do, Judith Butler's gender trouble? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know the line. Do you know, did you notice how the book has, as it were, two uh, axes? On the one hand, it has a theory of how we are constituted as, as sexual entities. You know, all this theory of it's not natural, essentialist, it's performatively enacted, contingent, all that stuff. Uh, on the other hand, she tells in the structure of the book a very linear narrative. It starts with stupid zero-level essentialism when people at some meeting zero point thought that our sexual identities are purely natural. And then, you know, Freud already makes one step, not radical enough. Lacan goes a little bit further, not radical enough. And to be slightly cynical, at the end we learn her lesson, how things really are. With Ernesto, still the best book with him and Chantal co-written, it's the same. You have this idea of this uh, pure fluidity, contingency of social identity, and then he also under uh, he also supplements this with a linear narrative. It starts with pure essentialism, and then you know you have the first breaks, Trotsky, Bolsheviks, this idea of uneven development. Uh, Gramsci, struggle for hegemony, but the idea is they still don't go far enough. They remain still essentialist. They think they can still combine uh, contingency with class struggle, Mao, uh, but then finally Ernesto comes and says, no, contingency is radical. There is no, uh, all there is is this totally contingent, this, uh, discursive games, struggle for hegemony is totally open, contingent, and so on and so on. My answer to which I didn't get the question, if you don't believe me, read the book, because I formulate this question, I think, if not in the first already text of mine, in the second is, which is precisely the relationship between these two aspects? That is to say, their basic theory, uh, all social identities are discursively constructed in an open, contingent process of symbolic articulation, and the linear narrative they are telling. In other words, is there positive theory 